have you ever noticed, I know you started answering this before, but I think we got derailed. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> have you noticed that the surgery- I, talk, I tend to talk a lot, so- <laughs> No, no, don't worry. Please um, it's this important up. stuff. <laughs> um, ha have you noticed that surgery improves brain fog or fatigue uh, at oh, all? Yeah. No, I mean, patients will, I mean, you can, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, one patient, uh, I remember one wife came up and said, you know, my husband had the surgery, you know, his sense of humor came back. And I said, how do you lose a sense of humor? Well, you know, it was a personality factor that had that, you know, she, he, he had a particular kind of sense of humor. And she said that, that you know, it, it really incapacitated him in a sense, and it came back after after surgery. So, you know, I think, um, you know, those things are complicated to understand, but they're certainly real observations. And certainly uh, brain fog and cognitive function and all that improve after effective surgery. Um, so the problem is, is that how effective is the, is the surgery, you know, and how aggressive is the surgery? You know, I mean, Dr. Millerat and Dr. Bolognese had aggressive approaches to surgery with tonsillar resection and generally good, good effects. But many neurosurgeons are a little hesitant to go and whack the tonsils off because the, you know, the vertebral arteries lie just below that. It's a, it's a dangerous area to go into and it's a very risky area unless you're particularly experienced in that. And so a lot of them don't venture to do that. Once you've, once you've resected, um, you know, once you've uh, gotten into that area, uh, the, the tonsils then become, there's arachnoiditis that takes place, all right? Um, you know, when you just take the bone off. And so now it's, it's, it's a much, it's a, a bit more difficult surgery to open the dura and uh, shrink the tonsils again. And uh, I think one of the contributions, uh, maybe not widely understood that Dr. Miller and Dr. Bolognese had is they attacked these patients aggressively that way and were very successful in improving outcomes with second, secondary surgeries. Because we, we, we had a habit of seeing a lot of patients who had had a standard bone-only decompression and needed to come back. About 25%, and Dr. Keating and other people have said, you know, about 20% of those patients need to come back for another surgery. And that second surgery is a lot more complicated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess speaking, we're going to go into the neurology specifically. I, there are some neurosurgical questions that I think I'm going to leave for another Q&A session. because I, Sure. I, because you're here, I think it's really important to ask these after as surgery one, questions. As one of our <laughs> I'm I'm not neurosurgeon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a patient that might be like a couple of years out of surgery, their syrinx is gone. There are residual motor problems in the hands and some subjective circulation issues. Are are these chiari related? Could they be? There never seems to be a definite answer when this particular patient goes yes. to their doctor. Yeah, I remember that question. It's uh, syringomyelia by itself damages tracts in the spinal cord. It, it damages pain pathways. All right, that are that cross centrally in the center of the spinal cord, and are, are, uh, so there's this classical feature of syringomyelia, which is called a dissociated sensory loss. People have very fine touch sensation, but they lose the sense of pain, um, which is very peculiar. P people can't understand, how can I burn myself when I can, when I can, when I can, uh, you know, I can feel everything so acutely, and yet I don't, I, I don't feel, uh, I, I burn my fingers with cigarettes. Um, so, but this dissociated sensor loss is the classical description, which was, began to be, that's how, pay, that's how neurologists began to identify uh, syringomyelia by, you know, by the time you identify that, that the spinal cord is damaged, you know, pretty, pretty beyond repair. Uh, when you go in and do anything that relieves the syrinx, namely shunting the syrinx, or more importantly, first relieving the chiari, the, the constriction at the cranial cervical junction, which frequently will decrease, will collapse the syrinx. Early on, when people started doing this, they would do a decompression and then shunt the syrinx. Uh, we found that, you know, if you didn't need to do that, you know, you didn't need to touch the spinal cord because you can damage tracks. If you just, if you just relieve the constriction, the, key, the syrinx collapses spontaneously. 
if you relieve the tethering and a thoracic spinal cord, the thoracic syrinx oftentimes withers away without necessarily having to shunt the syrinx. So anytime you poke the spinal cord or put a shunt in there or a hose in there, you're going to have some permanent lysis of, of tracts and, and the potential for neurological, you know, symptoms that, that um, may be persistent. So a lot of times you say, whoopee, you know, the syrinx collapsed. But 15% of those patients, the sensory symptoms and the pain gets worse because now these tracks that were separated come together and they begin working again, but they're all disconnected and they produce uh, bedeviling sensory, mo sensory problems and pain, which um, oftentimes is mistaken as uh, psychoneurotic and, and, and uh, drug-seeking pain behaviors, but it's, uh, it's really generally not the case. Yeah. When there's a history of syringomyelia, I mean, you you take you 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 release the Chiari and the syrinx collapses. You look at that patient. Patient has no more um, no more syrinx. Spinal cord looks almost normal. I had a woman I had a woman uh, from Staten Island who said she had to walk around she had to walk around the house without any clothes from the top up because she her her spinal cord looked normal, but she couldn't stand to have clothes on. Anything that touched her arms or her torso was excruciatingly painful. And uh, so this is something we call allodynia or dysesthesia. Um, and it is something that's uniquely associated with, uh, with syringomyelia, which is a, a nasty, nasty problem, you know. Yeah, um, kind of to that. There are a couple of different questions about balance issues. Um, so. I'm gonna to try to combine these two questions. So sure. there was one adult who was in an auto accident many, many years ago. They had had a shunt, a couple brain surgeries, walking was difficult. Um, they found that uh, writing was exhausting, even just writing. Um, they began doing martial arts, which made it a little bit better. And then they stopped because of COVID and everything shutting down. Um, and so they have noticed that their temperature fatigue and like, balance issues were way off after not having balance. And then also, this is a completely different situation, but in a six-year-old, they also realized that they had had decompression and then still maintained some balance issues after that surgery. So A, what causes that retention of balance problem? And then B, what do you do after you've had the surgery and it's still not getting better? What do you do to treat that? Well, I think, uh, you have to have a situation where you're con you're continually reassessing what the circumstances are. Uh, you know, is uh, you know there are things that can be looked at like motor conductions uh, and uh, spinal cord um, uh, stimulating studies and conduction uh, studies that can elucidate uh, continuing possible continuing problems. There can be secondary problems. Um, um, chronic demyelinating polyneuropathy problems from damage that may be triggered by earlier damage to the peripheral nervous system, diabetes and other things that can complicate things. So you have to kind of continually reassess those, those patients. Uh, when the syrinx collapses, that does not mean that there is uh, all the spinal cord is normal. The spinal cord, uh, the track changes and the subtle changes can only be apparent on autopsy series where you can see there's actually degeneration of these tracks. You really can't oftentimes see that on MRI scanning. Uh, uh, now there's more sophisticated MRI studies with track, uh, being able to identify tracks and that we may get a little better at that as time goes on. But uh, a lot of that, we just can't image it. But um, you, so you, you still want to look for recurrence of syrinx again, even after a collapse, it can recur. Uh, and uh, look for other other um, modalities of problems, you know. Mm -hmm. Constantly uh, a, value of, uh, a, a point of reevaluation. You know, the, the problem is that people say, well, you know, uh, you know, you had uh, you had some, you had this, you had that. We treated it. There's nothing more to do. That's not always the case. You have to reassess, reassess. Um, um, I think before we even go on, something that would be really helpful is if you were to say someone had already had surgery and they're coming back to you as a neurologist to kind of work out some of those lingering problems, what is the 
tests, what are the clinical batteries that you're going through to kind of make, to discern, determine how you're going to treat them going forward? What can people expect? Well, I think first, which doesn't happen all that often, is you want to listen to the patient, you know, and see what the, what the issues are, you know, uh, and uh, where they may ar arise from. Are they residual issues with respect to a prior syrinx? Then you can approach that with certain neuropathic pain treatments like gabapentin, um, at, at Topamax, other things like that that may be uh, may be helpful. Uh, you want to investigate nerve conduction studies and and and, and relook at the imaging of the spinal cord again, um, and uh, you know just keep a, a handle on what may be evolving. Once you do a series of imaging. Uh, studies, that, that's not the end of it. I think many patients need to be imaged three to five years after their surgery because uh, people say, well, you know, you had the surgery, you know, so you have these chronic problems, but, you know, there, there can be something else going on. You, you can have recurrence of the syrinx or development of a thoracic syrinx where it was a cervical syrinx initially. Uh, so it's um, uh, arachnoid cysts and other things that can be chronic uh, evolving problems uh, in this in the spinal cord region which are important to keep a handle on you know uh, so that's oftentimes missed in a sense you know it's, it, it's like one and done you know well you had this and you had that it was treated and so that's that's the end of it you know uh, um, well, it's constant vigilance. That, that that's got it. That really stems from a good doctor-patient relationship. Unfortunately, patients, you know, they may not get the best treatment from one neurology. They go to another. They go to another. You know, and when you get to the fourth neurologist, and you know, they they find out that you've seen three other neurologists already. You know, you tend to get short shrift of it again. It, it's 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 difficult. We have to try to develop an ability to have people concerned about chronic neurological, neuro, quasi-neurosurgical problems that stick with it and deal with the chronic chronic care issues. I mean, everybody's concerned about the acute management of things, not sort of the chronic evolution. It involves a good doctor-patient relationship, which is, uh, is something that needs to be established. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the only way you're going to get through those really chronic conditions and chronic problems is with a constant back and forth with a physician that you trust. Right. Um, yeah. Um,